Assalamu alaikum. Welcome everyone to live chat number 36. Uh, Jugal Bandi C is number 13. And we've been talking about buildings, but I thought this would be a great time to also talk about the architects who are responsible for these buildings or not responsible for the buildings. And who is an architect? Have we lost the concept of architect? Is there a new genre? Or is there a new genre we have to create? So today's book that I wanted to show you was the Pulitzer Prize winning architects. And the role that award schemes have. So that architect versus this architect is what we are going to discuss today. What is the difference between these two architects? And where is the future's architect? What is he going to look like, he or she? And the role that they're meant to occupy or they have occupied for centuries and whether they occupy that same role or not. Just in time, Jean is here to help me uh, answer questions. Hope you're all well. Here we go. Hello. All right. Hi. Hi, what am I going to help you with? Understanding what this is. Uh -huh. What is an architect, Jean? I don't know. You I help don't know me. either. You first. This, you first. This architect versus this architect. Uh -huh. Tell me about that object. Yes, tell me. This is a handmade terracotta ring uh, that has been used in a contemporary residence for insulation purposes instead of foam. So there was a series, there was millions of little napkin rings this wide, this is one section of it, filled inside the two walls. Very, very old school insulation and just created like this beehive between the two walls of these mm -hmm. terracotta, completely natural material for insulation. Instead of injecting foam into the buildings for insulation, which is what we do in modern structures. So I thought there's that. <laughs> the, Pr the Pritzker Prize laureates, in their own words, is what the book is called. The Pritzker and who laureates, in their own words. And the names are... Kazuyu Sajima, Nishizawa, Peter Zumthor, Jean Nouvel, Richard Rogers, Tom Main, Zaha Hadid, Jorn Utzon, Murkat, Jack Herzog, Muron, Rem Kulhas, Norman Foster, Renzo Piano, Rafael Moneo, Tadao Ando, Fumihiko Maki, Alvaro Cesar. I mean, most of these are probably friends of yours. They're all very uh, Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, I mean, immediately place me with the uh, ghost. Yes, so that ghost. Immediately, you immediately place me with the ghost. Well, it depends on how you define ghost, right? I mean, there's all these names here that we grow, we've all grown up with. Frank Gehry, <clears throat> Oscar Niemeyer, Ken Zortange. Richard Meyer, I am Pei, Louis Barragan, Philip Johnson. Uh, and I'm so glad Philip Johnson's at the end of that list. <clears throat> He's probably my least favorite. Talk about plagiarism. Um, anyway, so. Yes, 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 yes. Well, my favorite constructor is Imhotep. From Queen Hatshepsut's reign <coughs> yes. in ancient Egypt. And yep. he did not call himself an architect. And for me, that's, you probably say, oh my God, she's going to go for a route. And yes, I'm going for the route. But yeah, good. 
the profession of being an architect is modern. It grew right. out of the upper class in Europe and the United States, Thomas Jefferson, Burlington, in other words, educated gentlemen who read about architecture. They read Palladio's four books of architecture. They did not go to school. They did not have a registration test. They had the leisure and the means to basically study themselves. So when the profession started in the 19th century, it again is a privileged group of people and it has grown in that way. If you think about how expensive the education of an architect is today, not necessarily class delineated, but definitely costs a lot of money. Then you have to get registered. You have to, if, if you're an intern, you have to work for a certain number of years. So what the ghost to me is that these the whole process of becoming an architect is a ghost of what you just showed us, of what somebody who makes, somebody who constructs, and they construct in a way that literally puts their hands on the materials. They have first, first hand, to repeat the same thing, first hand experience in building. And from the educational point of view in almost every part of the earth, it was a ability to read the pulses of the earth to know where to locate a building, like what you feel when you go to your, the sacred sites in the Indus Valley. There wasn't, um, you know, a site plan, there wasn't a expert in any other sense than actual embodied experience. And what's interesting in the, within Heptop, and I'm sure anyone who knows ancient Egyptian is quivering at my Midwestern accent, <laughs> so I apologize, but he was a Mason. He was a Mason and the whole Masonic tradition as it grew up, and even Thomas Jefferson was a member, that Masonic tradition of the efforts like Imhotep to really build on the site. Now, you know, you and I just watched Exodus and it begins to be, you know, you wonder what history has done to maybe the reality of what it was like to build Hatshepsut's tomb. I, I really, I really don't know. But I do know that the word architect and the profession of architecture as those names that you read off, many of them star architects, is a modern imposition on the past to call the people who built the tombs in the uh, ancient sites in the Indus Valley, to call them architects. I don't think I've ever heard you even use that word when you talk about them. So that's my response. So that makes, that makes perfect sense. And I'm, I was hoping that you'd help me with the segue into it because We've been, we've been, I've been, we talk about the sacred buildings, we've talked about the geometric uh, patterns that give them vibrancy and bring them alive with sana. We've talked about memory <clears throat> and the relationship with food and trade of ideas, but we've not yet talked about the architect or the maker or the builder or the conceptualizer of these buildings as if they were immaculate conceptions where they just appeared out of... <laughs> out the need of any kind of a reproduction system. And, 
having seen Hatshepsut's uh, temple, it's a really profound building. And um, I found it very delicately designed in terms of its zoning and spaces, almost as if somebody had had a, an architect on it who'd done the floor plans and maybe even created 3Ds. Like they showed us in Exodus, this, they were talking about making a model. He made the model and he said, you know, this, the size will show power, it'll show strength. But they were looking at a model, they weren't looking at drawings. And I wonder if the uh -huh. mason was more like a sculptor of spaces than he was just a contractor or an engineer. And they may have picked masons who understood their material really well. So whether it's a stone mason or any other kind of sort of mason, as we know today, works with cement um, and concrete. But in those days, it was all stone. And Hatshepsut's temple is larger than the Acropolis, uh, Athena's temple, and still feels equally delicate, if not more. It has the layers of the colonnade, it has all the spaces on the inside, layer after the chamber, after chamber, after chamber. And it gradually, it gradually reveals itself, which is what I find peculiar about the Pantheon or the Acropolis, is there's no revelation. You see them from a distance, you see the leading tower from, of Pisa from a distance. The only thing that changes is your perspective comes closer to it. But there's no, <clears throat> there are no filters and veils that gradually mm. open the curtains of the performance for that building. So I, I feel like for me, there might be a bias, um, but I find that once you see it, the Pantheon has the Oculus up, uh, on its roof, which is fantastic. But you know, Stara Ando does that too. So there's no real like, nothing unique and spectacular there. <clears throat> the, uh, you know, I, I just thought it'd be fun to talk about what has happened to the ancient architect and this, this, this idea of a star architect. <clears throat> Are they really truly stars, Jean? Because if they were so, <laughs> if they were such stars, don't they have a social responsibility to be doing work that we talked about the ancient urbanity and the condition of our cities worldwide last week. And then in between, I did this workshop with uh, my staff in the office, um, the, design, the design folks, and just for them to just to see what the new generation thinks. And interesting enough, the, I think the star architect died and became a ghost in my generation because the new generation is not convinced that they are relevant and because they look around at the condition of the cities and say, why are the star architects not involved in heritage? Why are the star architects not involved in just tiny little uh, work? Why is it that the heritage conservation architect is sidelined and separated and sometimes even roll their eyes and say, oh, heritage, you know, you must be a fuddy-duddy if you're involved in heritage and you must be a romantic living a life of nostalgia. So I see this, I see, and then, and then the, the custodians of the heritage buildings have little to no idea of what history and heritage means. So, the, it's so you know, the architect who could come in and actually be involved in every little thing from creating these iconic buildings for their desire for immortality and progress, as we've been discussing, or they could be just fixing little details like the architect in Venice, and they're very happy with that. They're not tearing the city down. We spoke about this the other day. So I just wonder what has happened to the role and responsibility of the architect in terms of their connection to society and culture. I mean, have they really put themselves up on such a pedestal in like Rapunzel's Tower where they're totally inaccessible <laughs> to needs, needs of habitation, needs of the city, needs of the people on the street. So you look at these buildings, many of the residential buildings, even the office buildings in cities like Karachi, the uh, subcontinent, uh, some of the buildings coming up in China and Southeast Asia, some of them um, in South America. There's nothing really to write home about. And I, I just wonder, because the differentiation between the engineer, the contractor and the architect have become such blurry lines that I wonder if the architect has ghosted themselves, the architects have ghosted themselves out of the game, so to speak, by being so hell-bent on making iconic buildings only 
and not coming down to the earth and actually building for the common man. You know, I just, I, I wonder where, where he's gone. And that's why I titled this The Ghost Architect because I sort of feel like today's architect is a mere illusion of what they once used to be. Well, I, I think your discussion with your interns was, was very, very important. And it's a discussion that I've had with recently graduated architects, lighting designers, really people who have left school and gone into the work world. And the reason I say that I think it's really important, you spoke with the interns that are working where you are. I think the question you're asking is one that everyone has to ask where they are. The media makes the star architect worldwide, what you and I call the space-time collapse online, like after 9-11, the competitions for the site that had been destroyed, those competition drawings by and models and walkthroughs, those became copied all over the world. Nobody was looking at what was going on in place. So you're speaking with the interns, hearing their frustrations, and I hearing from my former students, but I'm hearing a very different kind of frustration because at their education involved engaging communities, using their tools, the things that they learned how to uh, facilitate and materialize, but not in, in relationship to a developer. The developer appears on the scene and often hires a star architect like Frank Gehry was hired by the real uh, reality realty company in Brooklyn. And as soon as everybody got excited about a Frank Gehry building there, they got rid of him and never built it. So the star architect and the developer with their money have, I think, inadvertently become a complete distraction. And as I was saying, the education in New York, and I don't want to be tooting uh, Parsons, but I know this the best, there is a design build studio. And what it means is that the students go into a community. And last year they went into a very, very early area in Brooklyn where a black community had lived. But they didn't pretend to know anything. They listened to what you have identified as the people living in the villages near ancient sites. Well, you know, in New York and maybe in other cities in the Western, quote, world, it's not a village anymore, but there are caretakers. There, there's either the neighborhood or, in this case, in Brooklyn, it has a semi-protected status. So there are caretakers, but they're very different than the villagers that you're talking about. So my point is, the students for a whole semester engage the community, listen to their story and what it is that they see is needed. So it's very much a listening to the story of the site as spoken by the caretakers and then the students transfer it with their skills into drawings, uh, if there's vegetation, into what vegetation, and, but they keep bringing it back to the community and the community has the final say. And then in the summer, they go to the site and build it. So that's an education that's very, very different than looking for media looking for stardom. And this has also happened with the New York City um, 
Department of Design and Construction, firms can, not big firms, not well-known firms, firms can apply to, for city government-sponsored jobs. And young firms have an opportunity to build for the city government, which again, very, very thoughtful architecture. They listen to the community. So that's a program that's been going on for a number of years. That's why I think it's really important that this conversation that you started be one that we each do in the place that we are with our feet on the ground, because the results will be different. Like they, they're the ones your students talked about or your uh, former, your interns. That's very different than what I'm hearing. I wonder, I wonder, um, <clears throat> I wonder if what appears to be very different, maybe underlying it, there's some connection. So the star architect is educated um, in a format which encourages the need for stardom, um, lack mm. of human uh, disconnection with the site. I have seen so many architects discuss sites without ever having been there. And I'm talking about student work. So when I get, when I used to get invited to juries, um, I would be very cautious about talking about a site, even if it was in Karachi that I hadn't visited, or I would get a copy of the program beforehand and visit the site so that it was a fair discussion with the student. Otherwise, you are making mockery out of the work by a student who spent multiple hours on a site has to justify their work with somebody in a patriarchal society who they're not allowed to challenge. And that's somebody who has no idea what that site is about. So <clears throat> I think that inherently somewhere I don't know if Thomas Jefferson is responsible for this or not, but somewhere in the education process of the Mason from the shrines in Pakistan to Mohenjo-daro to the Hanging Gardens of Babylon to uh, the buildings in um, Iran, uh, Persepolis, etc. I think that something has shifted in a really frightening manner where the architect thinks it's okay to do these disconnected solutions for design build problems like 9-11. Uh, the building that came up there, I was following that design, pro the submission of the competition. And it was frankly, it was hilarious because having lived in New York and watched the buildings go down that morning, I was expecting something that was much more subtle and much more humble to the event that had happened and the global impact that it was going to have and the reason it happened, including all the conspiracy theories. So when those competitions came in, they were just, it was, you talked about trendy fashion, trends in fashion. Who was that? It was you and I were speaking about it. And I was just horrified at people, the greed of the architect, the greed of the architect to get that iconic building in to make their name immortal, to have it be on the cover of this book. <laughs> like, so I, I don't understand it versus this architect who, who works with the earth that he can smell and see and form and work with and understands the movement of air, of heat, of humidity, the depth, <clears throat> understands the structure of a beehive, understands the geometric, sacred geometry that Sana drew for us and then creates something that never gets seen because it's lost inside to like anarchy and uh, like the dreams that you've had. So, and, and is not concerned about that. So, you know, there's a, there's a, the education is giving 
fuel to this fire of an ego that is just making these architects go further and further away. As I was discussing with these students that it's easy to critique and criticize and say, okay, but the, the young generation is saying that if architects are such cool humans and they go through this rigorous five-year training and education and they're bombarded with all sorts of things, why do our cities look the way they do? <laughs> why is the architect not connected to government? Why is the architect not connected, not the last person that somebody holds accountable to the condition of those buildings? And why are they not working in tandem with the urban planners? So, you know, it, which I think it's a fair question because an architectural degree, when I signed up for it, I wanted a degree that was holistic. And that's why Parsons program appealed to me that it didn't, it wasn't myopic. It allowed me to play with multiple different scales and materials and then let the dust fall naturally wherever it would in terms of my own spirit's needs and what it would resonate with as opposed to being in a one size fits all program that we have adopted in Pakistan and in India and in Bangladesh. And all our students suffer that same <laughs> ego of modernist architecture, which was designed for a different geography, a different climate, a different group of people, and a post-war different condition. 1930, 1940, 1925, rebuilding and just copy paste, copy paste, copy paste, box, 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 box. Even now, in a region where we have craftsmen, we have history, we have the sensitivity of dealing with our facades and our windows and our ventilation very differently pre colonization. It just gets whitewashed. I was at, very interesting that it's, I've just remembered that uh, in, a, in a recent tour group about eight or nine months ago, there was a few architects uh, who went with me to uh, the southeastern corner of uh, Sindh, where one of our restoration engineers was actually doing some work on a fort and he was re resurfacing its lime plaster now, I am also a victim of the same educational um, curriculum, which didn't teach me how important lime plaster was in the history of buildings across the region. I mean, how do you just completely forget the, the extremely heavy use of lime plaster for centuries from Turkey to Myanmar? I mean, you, it's just obliterated. So I've learned because of my exploration and discovery of how useless our history books, our architectural history books have been. It was interesting to watch these other architects who were with me, some a little bit senior also, be completely fascinated by the lime plaster process because it was, it was right there. And I just thought, how sad is this? That this is a fundamental of how buildings have been surfaced how facades have been treated in this region for so long. None of them had any idea of that process. So I think the new generation is thirsty. I believe the new generation has seen <laughs> I, I think they've seen the, the, the mockery that the curriculum is doing to their talent and their craft. And with just a little bit of a hint and a nudge, they might respond to some of this as well. I believe. I mean, I believe in their talent and uh, the future of the new generation. I mean that across the board, not just in Pakistan. I have, um, as you know, I am not within reach of my library like you are. And I have to really hunt. And I did at one time spend did research, which means searching, for the beginning of what you're talking about. That loss of going to the site, the loss of lime as a material that will actually amplify the in the interior 
the rhythms that the earth is projected through the building itself. I mean, these, the lime plaster, a colleague of mine has been, uh, she works for the Healthy Materials Lab at Parsons, jo, uh, John Sarah Ruth, and she spent a whole year, about a year and a half ago, going around the earth, talking to craft people who still have a lime process in their place. So it just shows, it's an example of exactly what you said. It had been lost. So when I was trying to answer this question, one of the things that um, came up was the media. And in the 19th century, that would have been the printing press. And the ability to reproduce uh, line engravings of buildings. So I was doing research about um, Richardson, a very, very important turn of this into the 20th century, H.H. H. Richardson. And his, he, what he did was he, he felt that the Romanesque way of building those, those extraordinary stonework was something that suited the energy of the democracy arising in the United States. And he looked at these line engravings in architectural journals to see what was going on in France. And of course, the line journal, the line drawing, gives you a very different impression of the materiality, of the actuality of the building. And someone I discovered had actually done research on how buildings in the United States, not Richardson, but how other architects interested in Romanesque, French Romanesque, began making buildings that look like the pictures in the media. So that's one dimension of it. How, instead of going to the site, but seeing or being interested and not understanding how media transforms it, unless you've been there. So that's one way that not going to the site began to be a acceptable um, alternative, let alone then your work got into these architectural journals. And I went to Columbia University that has the largest architectural library going all the way back to manuscripts in the world and looked at these ancient or well, not ancient, 19th century journals to see what these pictures look like. And of course, there's also the fact that your name gets carried from France to the United States or vice versa. So that's one beginning step. But I, I am really interested in this question that you raise in relation to the international style. So suddenly you have architects creating in a way Western architects that they say applies everywhere. So Mies builds the same in Ber Mies van der Rohe in Berlin as in Tokyo. In other words, they level the site almost into a grid like you were you know, building a model or making a drawing. And then they raise the building up. So like the Seagram's building in New York City, again, one that I could go to and study. It's a beautiful building in and of itself, but its context is not the site, which actually is sloped. It goes downhill from Park Avenue and it's not evident in the, the siting of the building, in the way in which the building engages the uh, context. The only thing that happens is that this racket club across the street, which is, uh, 19th century Romanesque is reflected in the glass of the Seagram's building. So the international style and the selling of this, that it's international, meaning anywhere in the world, it applies. And you do this by sealing off the context, like in terms of air 
and smell and all the things that you are talking about that infuse your body when you go to a site and you stand on it whether it's in Brooklyn or the Lower East Side in Manhattan, where I've done a lot of work with my students on how you engage a community and listen to their voice. So the um, international style, sealing buildings off. And of course, what happened then is air conditioning became necessary, no matter where you are in the world. And then the air, the hot air of the machines, at first was uh, vented out on the sidewalks. Later, it went all the way up to the top of the building. But you're heating up the atmosphere. And then what happens? You get climate change. You've changed the climate. Or when the World Trade Center was attacked, nobody had a window. They couldn't break them. I mean, the, the ramifications of the international style, not intended, but definitely the architects seeing themselves as having created something that was relevant everywhere and media being a, a very important transmitter. That's, you know, that's my hypothesis at this point. So I think... Um... Mies did what he did, and there were some, uh, let me just call them charming ideas. This Seagram's building is, it's okay, it doesn't, doesn't turn me on. It didn't when I was at school. Uh, the Romanesque clubhouse in front of it is equally blasé as far as I'm concerned, but they served a purpose for a function and for a group of people at a certain point in time. My question really is, in terms of evolution, that we came, we came right up to uh, the arts and crafts movement, to Art Nouveau, where craft was still being celebrated, color was still being used, there was, there was flowers, there were motives from things that were culturally relevant, whether it was the arabesque, or it was uh, birds, or it was just shapes, there was, there was a life to those buildings beyond just serving a purpose of box, on top of box, next to a box, glass box, concrete box. Uh, maximum, it had a pitched roof. Uh, oh wait, really, really beautiful. It was elevated off the floor, the Farnsworth House. So, um, or the Barcelona Pavilion, what, so, and which was all about, it was show off of materials. What, what baffles my mind is that how did that escalate into just a desire for immortality. I mean, like you said, the name is being carried from point A to point B. Uh, there's buildings that the modern masters have created in India, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan mm -hmm. here. Um, they all look the same. And if you take the label of the city where it's at, out of it, they have made no, no effort to fit that to the climatic and cultural context of that city or of those people. Now, here's where I give credit to our British colonialists. The buildings that Karachi has from the British era that were the modern buildings not, uh, that they built for us. In the Victorian times, so we're now looking at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, so 1850s, 1880, 1910, 1920. Nine, the buildings that they had built for us uh, used the local material. They understood ventilation. They understood the humidity. They understood the, the type of people that would be using these places. There is no other building that the Brits have left here in the United Kingdom. You cannot say, look, this looks like that building. There's no one size fits all. They actually built what was climatically appropriate. They still had the Corinthian columns. They still had, they still had the Renaissance facades, but the, um, but the material was local and the people that used it local and it was maintained. They knew that it would be maintained with a lot of humidity and dust and dirt and just the way people are over here. Um, so that's something to think about. And then we, went, we come into the international style post-Baroque and you look at these lifeless, soulless buildings in an environment where there is no dearth of 
affordable craftsmen. So when the international style was being developed in Europe, the craftsmen had been lost to the battles. There was no money. The economy, the economy had to be rebuilt. Women were sent into the factories. Um, Chanel had to sort out fashion. But why, why does that apply today in areas where we do understand climate and we do have a connection to the earth? And there are craftsmen and there are materials we can use. It's, it's been completely shelved forgotten about. And in this entire list, interestingly enough, in this entire list, unlike the Aga Khan Award, in this list, there's not one architect that does culturally sensitive work in that entire list. Not even, not even Tarao Ando, whose work I love, even his work, or Peter Zumthor's work is experiential, but it's not culturally connected. You have so many astute questions and it's sparking all kinds of responses. I saw one person on the chat ask about markets. And of course, yes. markets are very, very important in all of this in terms of the client. Now, whether the client is a developer or a government agency or a patron, the market is a player. And a hypothesis I have, and I, I, I don't like using this word because it becomes a substitute for thinking about it, but the industrialization of materials and the standardization of materials into the marketplace, sidelines, the craftsmen. I've known uh, young architects who were able to find somebody who had patrons now who would allow them to draw, would allow like your patron at, in, at the beach time. So the marketplace and the availability of standardized materials, the loss of the guilds that built on the sites and the construction process that has become very um, dependent on these standardized materials. So I think that, that plays a really important part in answering your question. The other one, the other thing that occurs to me is the resistance of people like John Ruskin and William Morris in the West. Now, again, the, um, the, you have to ask the question in your area, you know, exactly what did happen? Why did that way of building in the late uh, 19th century uh, go out of practice, the one you talked about? Because certainly the colonial presence had been there already for 300 years. So that um, connection to place was still there right up until the point you described. There must have been people like John Ruskin and William Morris, who, when I was taught architectural history by one of the great historians, Henry Russell Hitchcock, who argued that, you know, this was a retro effort. They were not progressive. They were not progress oriented. And that to me, this whole mythology of progress, meaning things have to keep moving forward. And if we're making materials in a standard way, Levittown, we can build, you know, endlessly the same, and that's progress. We've got all the veterans returning from the wars. Here's a home. Here's the loan system, how you can get it. So there are so many factors that the idea that we make progress by continually 
having something that applies everywhere and then it's replaced by the latest which is often what the star architect becomes a conveyor of and then you know everybody follows it so that um in relationship to why is it that heritage sites are looked at askance i think progress is one of the reasons and in architectural education even now the idea of geometry and talking about ancient geometries is one that i have had colleagues i know very well stop listening to me that's why i call it the geometry of life it's sacred because it sustains yes. life yes. and then i think people start to listen so there are so many built in knee jerk reactions that no one stops not no one i don't want to exaggerate that it takes people like yourself and your interns who see so clearly what's happening to karachi but the veils i'm convinced have been torn off everywhere and that's why i mentioned last time we were talking that when that happens and i use florence i meant to point to the immediate follow up from the black death in florence and the emergence of having a solid grasp of the context that brunelleschi is a indicator of but then you have vasari writing the lives of artists and all of a sudden they're magnified brunelleschi was doing a scientific experiment he wasn't trying to be uh immortalized so you get this you know this uh two things happening at once the artist is being picked out the architect is somehow above the rest of us and one of the most fundamental things i think needs to be rekindled is we're all we all have a creative longing we all you know why are so many people baking now who are at home <laughs> you know making their own food and i i know many architects like my daughter who are fabulous cooks because you can get the results right away and there used to be this incredible restaurant down on Spring Street called Bread and it was all these architects from Cornell and the bread looked like little buildings it was fabulous the soup bowls were huge materials were real you know it was immediate satisfaction so this is a moment and you know we have a choice we could go back to what we had before but people are saying Oh I like not having the cars in the streets. I think 40 streets in New York City are not going to have cars returning. And that could have never happened. So that's what it seems to me if we each of us stops asking for somebody else to do for us but we do it. That's why I I say to my colleagues when they give me an idea i say well wait 3 days before you speak about the idea and then you do it don't hand it to me i've got my own uh desires of what i want to see happening and i'm doing it you can't just hand it over that means you've lost your own initiative yeah someone is saying instant gratification people want instant i have to give it to them no the you've got to don't even speak about it for 3 days can you wait and really look and see what you're asking for <laughs> 
oh, the looks that I get. <laughs> the evil eye looks. I can imagine. You do it. You know, you're here. We're trying. We're struggling. I don't care whether you're five years old. Yeah. Nine years old. You've got so many ideas. You don't want to listen to me anymore. That's so, so interesting. The one point in that it really jumps out along with everything else, of course, is, is the idea of the architect believing that within a democratic system, they are better than everyone else. Mm. So that attitude of a holier than thou um, frame of mind for me is only relevant and appropriate if they apply it across the board to everything. I mean, if you want to flex your ego muscle, then you get involved in everything that is being built, not just the iconic towers and the multi-million dollar homes that allow you the decadence to uh, <laughs> to, to uh, pander to your ego, but actually to the, the poor income housing, also the favelas as well, get involved and get help, help them as well. So that's where I would suggest. And, you know, as over the years, also the way we've been taught, when, when I look at the way we're taught how to draw, it's what you said, we're looking at everything as if we're better than it from above. So you're looking down at this building, mm -hmm. so that you're making in terms of your own body's relationship to it, it's not feet on the ground drawing it this way. You're not drawing sketches of 3Ds and just for construction purpose, turning into flat AutoCAD plan, you start designing in the flat AutoCAD format, which I think is problematic because your relationship with the earth and that building is always godlike above it, waiting, weighing down on it instead of designing the building as a series of movement and a series of um, expressions that are three-dimensional. Um, and then you, you take those and you then cut sections through them and you give them to people who will build it. But we expect construction drawings to mimic design drawings. And I feel like no wonder we're just left with architects who are being blamed for not finding true solutions and habitation problems, especially in the urban environments in the cities. But the oh, architect, oh, you just, you just design pretty buildings. Or your, your responsibility is just to make it look good. You're just the aesthetic guy. We actually have a real engineer who will do the, the, the thing for us. You just make sure that it looks pretty. And I think that if, if that's what the architectural field has reduced itself to, it's a sad state of affairs, which brings me back to my whole question of, have they ghosted themselves up? Architect become a ghost of himself. And should he be reinvented and redefined? Because everything has changed. It's changing. We're in the change now. It's happening, as you say. So the future of the architect cannot be in this book, in with these people and whoever decides what the criteria is to give them these prizes. I mean, that whole criteria format has to be burnt and redefined. Well, 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 <laughs> the, um, you have laid down the gauntlet. You've offered a challenge. So I say to you, do it, do it. Just like I said, just like I said. And that's, that's I think, the opportunity every Every school at whatever level is, is rethinking whether even, to, even if they can meet in person. So the loss of the body, the very vehicle that we're talking about as the one to work from. And like at many of the schools in the United States, which brought our president to court because he said no international students can stay in the United States if they not if they're going to be online. So 180 higher institutions, many of them with schools of architecture, challenged it and it was not, you know, it was struck down. Okay, so now all of us are scrambling 
because architectural education is being remade. And the things that we're talking about, the how is it going to be remade? I mean, Mark Gardner, who is the professor of the Design Build Studio, he would be a wonderful person to talk to about this because he was on the ground with the students, building, talking to the community. And now all of a sudden, he's going to have to be online. So this is, you know, this is a turning point whether people try and figure out schools how to take everything online, it's not going to be the same. It's not going to be the same, obviously, whatever school it was, whether they were still teaching in the star architect tradition or they were teaching, as I described, locally, feet on the ground, whether it's a housing project, for a government agency, feet on the ground. The students are there looking. But some of the tools, like you're pointing out, do distance them from continuing to work from being on the ground. It's, it's here. The opportunity is here. And you have the makings in your hand. <laughs> yes, you've got the makings in your hand. So it's, uh, if, I guess this is going to be the closing sentence. So this is a really, uh, it's something that sits on my office desk all the uh -huh. time. Keep me reminded of what we can do. It's actually, I've seen them be produced, uh, custom made to a specific size. I've seen them being put into these walls and I've seen rooms being completed and how effective it is, much more effective than the foam. So I keep this in front of me as a reminder that the architectural education and professional practice should be, is, and it is open for evolution and open for regrounding, and it can be brought back to the earth. Whatever has happened has happened, but we don't need to be slaves to that tradition and hold on to something out of some weird desperate insecurity if we, if the, if the education is as broad and as erudite as it claims to be, then one should, as an architect, be able to shift gears uh, with its inner security that it's not going to cause any problems in their desire for iconic uh, uh, immortality. That there, is, there are other ways of doing something that is phenomenal and in a very small, intimate, invisible series of gestures. So I think the exploration has begun. We've started it in our office. And I think this is a conversation that we should continue. We will continue. I'm hoping that Parsons will pick it up as well. And then we can get into this dialogue with them. So once again, thank you so much, Jean. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Wonderful to see familiar faces. Um, enjoy your evenings where the sun is set. And enjoy your days where it's still warm and sunny. Thank you so much. Jean, look after yourself. Thanks again. Bye. Till next Bye. time.